Scott Feinberg from The Hollywood Reporter, and thank you for tuning in to our 2013 Breakthrough Performers Panel. I'd like to introduce our panelists left to right, so let's start with Adele Xarshabalis, who plays Adele in Blue is the Warmest Color, Greta Gerwig, Francis Holliday in Francis Ha, uh, David Oyelowo, uh, Louis Gaines in Lee Daniels the Butler, um, Olivia Wilde, who is Kate in Drinking Buddies, Barkad Abdi, who is Muse in Captain Phillips, and Katherine Hahn, who is Rachel in Afternoon Delight. And we thank you all for being here. And uh, just immediately for the sake of you and for our viewers, we want to clarify what does it mean? What is a Breakthrough Performers Panel? We wanted to recognize, as we've not done in past years, people who have done something really exciting and new this year. It could be your first credit, could be your 50th credit. It could be an American in an American movie. It could be a foreigner in a foreign movie. It could be somebody in a movie that was a giant hit. It could be somebody in a more independent movie. I want to begin with Greta. Can you, <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about, uh, you know, your, your path to this is uh, a little bit unconventional and went through uh, South by Southwest Film Festival, was sort of instrumental. Can you just give us a, a little background on your history? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I kind of always wanted to be an actor, but I, I, I'm, I'm from, I'm actually from Sacramento and I didn't know anyone who was a professional actor or artist. And I, I wanted to go to a BFA program, but my mom wasn't so keen on it. So I went to a school in New York at Barnard College and just did regular liberal arts. And it, but I, while I was there, I realized how hard it was to be an actor because I think sometimes when you're isolated from it, you can just be dream about it and it feels like anything's possible. But then when you actually are encountered like, oh, this is so difficult and you'll probably, it probably won't work out. But I, what I did decide was that I really wanted to be part of um, theater or film or television, just storytelling with actors. And I didn't care what job I was gonna do. I just wanted to be part of it. So I was writing and stage managing and then I, was, I had done a tiny part in a Joe Swanberg movie called LOL. I didn't even do a part. The guy I was dating at the time used my voicemail messages in the movie. <laughs> so <laughs> I really was not hired to act. <laughs> but then I went to South by Southwest because it fell on my um, spring break. And I met uh, Ty West and Mark Duplass and Andrew Wojcicki and all these people who were so amazing and I was such a fan of their films. And then Joe asked me, do you want to come live in Chicago and make a movie and live in a house? And I said, yes. And then I still had day jobs and stuff like that. And I was like applying and getting rejected from graduate schools. And then eventually someone paid me to act <laughs> on a regular basis. That's a, that's a horrible, circuitous way of explaining it. But it was, but I knew I wanted to be part of the world. And I think that that was the biggest thing for me that kind of allowed me to break in any door that was open. And David, you uh, have told the story before, I guess, about you have a, a Nigerian father who, when you told him you wanted to become an actor, was less than enthusiastic about it. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you know, in terms of Nigeria generally, or certainly my dad's generation, the idea of the arts is just a complete, and it's so alien. You know, it's academia, you know, he had three sons, he wanted a, a doctor, a lawyer, and an engineer. So, you know, I, I came in and, and said, uh, I wanted to be an actor. And, uh, you know, he, got, he could just kind of laugh. <laughs> what are you talking, what are you talking, actor? <laughs> you know, so, it, 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 and then, it, you know, as, as it became more and more serious, this, this idea, the, the panic kind of set in. Uh, of, of, of the reality of it, but, but what happened is I got a scholarship to go to the London Academy, and that, that was my in. Uh, oh, a scholar. We can tell everybody back in Nigeria you're a scholar. Um, so, uh, so that was the way I kind of wheedled my way through that. And Adele, for people who have seen Blue is the Warmest Color, this might come as a surprise, but you were actually a very shy child, isn't that true? In real life? In real life. It's because, like, it's not my language, so it's different, but uh, yeah. And so part of the way of overcoming that, I guess, was it your parents' suggestion that you take some acting classes, or how did no, that? It's because when I was eight, I was really, I got a lot of energy, so my parents say, you have to put this on something, and I was like, uh, maybe I should make improvis improvisation class. So I integrate a class where we just have to like pick words and make improvisation, and one day I've got the chance that at 12, a cast director came, 
and it starts from there. I, I pass cast, fa failed one, succeed one, and on shoot I realized how much I won't be involved it, in it and in this like human adventure and in making story. And the deal with my parents were if you had pretty good marks at school, you can make movie. And it starts from there. Wow. And Olivia, I think you were 18 when you first came out here. Uh, and you've called it, and when I interviewed you once before, it was a slow progression, you felt. Uh, yeah. Is that? Is well, I was a casting assistant. So I've brought coffee to almost everyone I've now worked with. Wow. <laughs> so I know how they treat assistants. Right. Uh, and, and everyone very nice. But I started out slowly and did TV and did movies, some big, some small. And it's funny, I was telling Catherine just now that I feel like I've been working for 12 years professionally, but I feel like I just started. So that's a weird thing that can happen in this business. You can have a lot of experience and then do something you're really proud of and say, okay, now I feel like I can call myself an actor and I'm doing what I want to do. Wow. Barkad. First movie, uh, Captain Phillips, it's, it's a hit, and everybody's talking about it. Your story, your journey is uh, probably taking you further than anyone here. You are from Somalia. Can you talk about, connect the dots from how you were there as a boy to ending up here now, uh, 28 years old, I believe. Um, a lot's happened in a little time. What's, how would you summarize it? Um, well, I was born in um, Mogadishu, Somalia, and by the age of six years old, uh, the war started, civil war started, so we were stuck in that city for about a year. And after that, our mom found a way to get us out of uh, Somalia, and we went to Yemen. My dad was a teacher in Yemen. Uh, I started school there, I started a new life there, and lived in Yemen for about seven years. And then we found the lottery visa to the U.S. And we came to Minneapolis, and I started high school. In Minneapolis, Roosevelt, and just one day, um, the auditioning call came uh, on the local TV channel, so I just, I went there for the <laughs> audition, and it was just a big uh, crowd of people there. It was a huge crowd of people. I uh, met some friends there, um, we created a group of for and we practiced. We finally got called to LA and <laughs> got the part. Wow, amazing. That's a, that's a Hollywood story, that's uh, amazing. And Catherine, uh, so you go through Yale School of Drama and uh, were you at that time sort of primarily thinking of your future as a theater person or a film or were you hoping for film? I mean, I actually I didn't uh, get to Yale until much, much later either. I started when I was 27, which is like uh, kind of late in the game. And I, um, yeah, I grew up in Cleveland, mid both Midwesterners. Midwest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I always, I always wanted to do it. I mean, I, was, I, my, I have two little kids now, and I remember, I remember as a kid, playing like West Side Story records and just like bawling and looking at myself crying in the mirror. <laughs> like, I'm just feeling it. And I, I, we've got a bunch of uh, CDs for my kids. Like we got Sound of Music and Annie and all these musicals. And I play them now in the car when I'm driving them around. And I looked and caught my daughter just like listening to West Side Story, just like looking out the window. She's four. <laughs> and I could just see it. I was like, uh-oh. Like she just went somewhere so deep listening to it, it was so moving to me. I was like, because oh, I remember it. I just remember that feeling. And um, yeah, I did like, I did a uh, children's television show in Cleveland called Hickory Hideout, <laughs> which I talked to two squirrel puppets, not so and Shirley Squirrely. <laughs> yes, it was called Hickory Hideout. Uh, and I did, you know, I moved to New York after I went to undergrad at Northwestern. I moved to New York with my then boyfriend, now husband, and worked as a receptionist in a hair salon and did everything. I was obsessed with the backstage back when it was like a, <laughs> you would go get it at, at the, and you would go look and see all the auditions and there would be ones we would always laugh about the no pay nudity ones. I was like, oh, sign me up. <laughs> like a wait in line. Uh, and it just did like a ton of, I was worked at the Williamstown Theater Festival for ever and ever and tore down sets and made no money at all and then accrued more debt with Yale. 
<laughs> so yeah, it took a, like a really long time, and I feel the same way about Olivia. Like I feel like it's, it's, I feel weirdly brand new, even though like I've been doing it my whole life, really. But it feels uh, uh, brand new. Well, let's let's talk specifically about how the the films that we just mentioned earlier, how they came to each of you, how you came to them. Um, David, you had worked previously with Lee Daniels within something like a year just before The Butler. How did you two connect? And, and clearly you did connect because he asked you back. Well, we had actually connected before The Paperboy even. Uh, he was going to do a film called Selma, and this was in uh, 2010. And um, he had cast me as Martin Luther King in that film, and we spent about a year maybe a year and a half trying to get that film off the ground. And in that time when it was, you know, for whatever reason, it just wasn't coming together, he had sent me the script of, of The Butler. And to be honest, I did not want to like this script at all. Because I was like, no, 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 we are doing Selma. I've been studying Martin Luther King, and that's what we're doing. Um, and then he sent me this script, and it just blew my head off. I mean, the ambition of it, this, these many characters, these many... Uh, facets, you know, the social side, the, the, the political side, the civil rights side, the historical side, the racial side, all in one, one script. And he told me to, to take a look at this, this role of the butler's son, and much to my chagrin, I loved the script. I called him up, I went, oh, okay, this is great, but we're doing Selma. Um, and then, um, for whatever reason, Selma didn't come together, and the butler was really tough to, to get off the ground. It's a big hit now, but no one wanted to make it. Um, and uh, so in the meantime, we went off and, and made uh, this film, The Paperboy, and, and soon afterwards, it was actually while we were in Cannes uh, with The Paperboy that suddenly, you know, a bunch of foreign territories sold, and then, you know, we were off to the races. And, and so it was kind of, I, I was aware of the script. The first time I think I'd read it before we shot it was two and a half years before, before we actually did it. What was the name of that movie, honey? In the Heat of the Night. In the Heat? Of the night with Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier is a white man's fantasy of what he wants us to be. What are you talking about? He just won the Academy Award. He's breaking down barriers for all of us. By being white. By acting white. Sidney Poitier is nothing but a rich Uncle Tom. Look at you. All puffed up. With your hat on your head. Coming in here. Saying whatever you want. You need to go. What? Get the hell out of my house! What are you no, doing? No, 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 Get on no, out! Now, everybody just sit I'm down. sorry, Mr. Butler. I didn't mean to make fun of your hero. Everything you are and everything you have is because of that butler. And Catherine Jill Soloway had never written or directed a movie before Afternoon Delight. Um, how did you two connect, and did you have any... Doubts. I mean, I, I'm sure there are a ton of uh, first-time writer directors that would love to have any of you guys in their movies. How do you weed out the ones that actually are capable of doing it? Oh, I mean, I have not been afforded those opportunities, or those opportunities hadn't really come to me. And I, when I read this script, I mean, I had to. I we it was my mommy's first Skype session was <laughs> with Jill to try to. I was. I wanted to be a part of it so badly. I trusted her voice, and. Um, her gut it's such a specific it's so it's so uh, carefully um it's so observant in such a non-judgmental way it's just such a amazing picture of a time in our 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 culture this weird little subculture of, of silver lake right now and this uh, new parents and i uh oh, just beg borrowed and stole <laughs> i just try i really did uh i just trusted her immensely. So a few weeks ago, the, the truck was parked right across the street from Sam's. Wait, let me get you, let me get you some food at the truck. Sam who? Uh, Hofbrau. You know Sam's Hofbrau? That was the strip bar or like, you know, topless place or whatever that we went to. Yeah, oh, you need cutlery. Anyway, who would have thunk it? Ran into McKenna. I don't know who McKenna is. Oh, she, um... She's the dancer. That she's the dancer that gave me that private thingy when we were in there. You mean the stripper? Okay, sure. The stripper is in the maid's room. The stripper's in the maid's room. Yeah. How did the stripper get in the maid's room? I put her there. 
for, for Barkhad. You mentioned that you um, met up with some friends at the audition, and yeah. that, according to Paul Greengrass, was a big part of what sold him on you guys because he saw we don't have to work to make these guys a believable unit. Um, who were these guys? What was your history? And also, I, I remember um, reading that you had sort of directed music videos, so the actual process of putting something together and, and a, a somewhat like a film was not totally unfamiliar, right? Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, I actually uh, did a short film and I did a couple of music videos. And I would, I was always a visionary. I was just, you know, I was doing my own. I would direct it, I would shoot it, edit it, the whole nine yard. But, and these guys were um, close friends, little brothers. Both of them are, like two of them are. And after all that, we were lived on the same apartments, you know, and we grew up on the same apartments. We know each other very well. And they were the closest people to me there. So after we realized we each had different parts, you know, we decided to make our own group and, you know, we practiced a lot together. So, you know, that, that helped. Um, us get familiar with it and you know through the whole movie you know we just like we became we got to know each other more working on the film and you know we became like brothers now. Um, Adele, you have been in some movies, some uh, TV programs before Blue is the Warmest Color, but at the time that you first met Abdel Latif Kashish, the director, what were you up to at, at, in your life at that point? Mm, nothing. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I was 18. It was two years ago. I was just like going to school, and one day um, my agent speak to me about the cast, so I made it. It was during like two months, and after one day they told me Abdel Latif wants to meet you, so I came into a, a, a small coffee and I meet him. And it was really not cool because he, he doesn't speak a lot. He really just observe you, ask you to eat something because you love watch people eat, so <laughs> you're like, okay. And uh, so after this meeting, I was like, I'm not gonna have it. And they told me, Abdel Latif wants you to come again. So we tried to confess each other, to speak each other and to build something, but I was not picked. And it was during two months and he was testing me. Uh, he was like asking me to make some sport. And also he was making me participate to the casting I was playing the role of Lea Sedou, but she was already picked, and I make people pass for my own role, so that was weird. But I wasn't asking nothing because it was too weird to ask. And after one day, he told me, "You're free. It's you." Wow, wow. And were you were you shocked? Uh, to be honest, during the coffee, I was shocked, so I was like, "Okay." And when I go out of the coffee, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a, a slightly um, less circuitous way to a part would be to write it yourself. And Greta, that was what yeah, you Yeah, all and... of my stories involve <laughs> me making a song and then dancing to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about, I mean, okay, so you had previously worked with Noah Baumbach on Greenbird. And now you guys, was it during that process that you decided to do something with Francis Ha? No, it was actually after, um, after Greenberg was out and, and he 
to be totally honest, I don't think he knew that um, he was really asking me to co-write anything. I think he was interested. He said, would you be interested in making a movie? He wanted to make something that was uh, pared down a smaller crew. And would I be interested in collaborating on something like that? And I had been acting a lot, but I hadn't been finishing anything I was writing. And I had all this material. And I sent, I sent him all this material of just scenes, of snippets of scenes or moments or things I thought belonged in a movie. And then he thought they were interesting and good and we started writing it and I think it took it was a year of writing off and on it wasn't we weren't it wasn't like a year of solid writing but it was a year it took a year and then we were mostly writing in different places and we would email the script back and forth and um, I, I, I think both of, I, I don't know it's hard to it's like hindsight's 2020 in some ways I think I don't know that I thought that we would ever make it into a film I thought I thought I mean, especially because I've spent so much time in like micro budget world and like super indie world, there is sort of a feeling of maybe we're sitting in it and just talking about something. Maybe we're just exchanging things and it'll never get done and maybe it will get done, but it, it doesn't ever, I've, I've had plenty of projects where I've written whole scripts with people and you know, it doesn't happen. And so I think in some ways it, it, there's a freedom to feeling like you're completely under the radar and yeah. and nobody expects it and nobody's asking about it or and um, so then acting was acting and it was once the script was done was kind of a different I almost wasn't thinking about acting in it and um, I'm glad I did but I had a moment of feeling like I I wasn't sure that I wanted to because I, after the script was written I was so proud of it and I felt like it was such a good piece of writing and then I, I didn't want to like mess it up or say anything so um, but I, I messed it up. <laughs> so good. <laughs> but yeah, but it, no, it's, it was a, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's gratif it's, it's exciting to write something and see it on its feet. But I would say more than that for me, it was like see, acting with other actors and hearing other really great actors say lines that I'd written was like, that was like blew me away. I was like, you guys are treating this like it's real. <laughs> Do I look old to you? No. Yes. How old? Older than I am. Older than 27. No. 27 is old, though. Well, one of the things um, with which Greta is very associated, even though I think it was only a six-month phase of your life, yeah. is the mumblecore uh, yes. era. And a part of that also was Joe Swanberg. And I am just curious, Olivia, if you'd ever previously sort of had somebody send you or suggest that, here, let's do a movie. There's no script, but we'll give you, I guess, what was it, like sort of a page outline or what happened? Yeah, we had an outline that for a while Joe wouldn't show me. He told me over the phone what the ideas were, and I scribbled them on a napkin, which I lost right away. And I could vaguely remember, but he kept saying, we'll sort of figure it out once you get here. We'll figure it out based on who you guys are and what your relationship to each other is. And this had never come my way before because I don't think anyone would have thought I was capable of it before. I'm not sure what made Joe think that I could, but I'm so glad he did. And I'm so glad that, that I took the opportunity because it was totally liberating. And the story is just about two people who uh, are friends, but it's like an ambiguously romantic friendship and it's set in the world of beer of microbreweries in Chicago. And so I thought, because I was familiar with Joe's work and had seen him and takes the stairs and LOL, I was like, oh, we're all gonna live in a house and no one's gonna get paid and we're gonna eat together and live together and it sounds so fun and we'll just like roll out of bed and shoot a scene or whatever happens, happens. It was a little more structured than that, um, I think for the first time for Joe, but not much. I mean, we'd get to work and see what felt right and I'd say the biggest challenge was learning to really trust myself to say something that was not funny or smart or relevant and have it be totally fine. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, I walked into it blind. Jake Johnson, who's my co-star in it, he and I met actually in Kansas a month before at a, at a baseball game and said, do you know what we're doing? Do you know what's <laughs> happening? I said, I don't know. Let's just show up and see. 
And at one point, we'd been shooting for three weeks, then Anna Kendrick showed up to do a, a great role, um, and she worked for like a, a week, I think. She showed up knowing nothing and just launched into it. And, and somehow, I think with Joe's great editing, it turned into something good. Are you so good at blackjack? Oh, because when I was younger, I used to work in um on the riverboats in the casinos. What? Yeah, my family, we all played cards growing up. So when I was like 19 or 20 or whatever, my buddy got me a job or an interview with this Chinese guy who ran a company called Network Management, <laughs> which is just like a fake company. And then I got the job, it was an hourly wage, and he sent me on the boats with 10,000 bucks for eight hour shifts. So I was just a, a worker, but my game was, you know, cards. That's crazy. Yeah. Should we go have a smoke? You want to sit outside? Okay. You want to? Yeah. How long was the shoot? Like, I think 18 days total. When we, when we made Hannah Takes the Stairs and we all lived in a house together, there was this list by the door of, like, things we needed, like eggs, milk, and then finally someone put script. <laughs> I begged. I was panicking that we didn't have a script. And then I heard that there was, like, a secret script on set that Joe had, and I was like, there's a script. we got to find the script. And he wouldn't show us, and it was, like, ideas in case we couldn't come up with anything. But it was, you know, it was so interesting because the whole process was me trying something and Joe saying, stop trying to be funny. Stop trying to be funny. Oh. And I was like, okay. Ah. And just letting it be uh, very, very, very raw. The funny thing is people who know me watch the movie and they're like, oh, it's you. You're just you. And people who don't know me are like, you're a great actor. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's just me being. <laughs> but you being you is actually harder than it sounds. And I think that was the big lesson was like learning to relax and just embrace that process was a challenge because I had been in such corporate structured environments before so it's well good. and for for each of you I think there are sort of I guess anybody who's in in a, a becomes a public persona there there's a certain like if you do something really well you're almost punished for it because people can only see you in that vein right and I wanted to ask you about how uh, in a number of these cases, you really broke away from that. And Catherine, um, I guess one thing that I would say with with you, and uh, you know, a lot of people saw Step Brothers or Anchorman, where you were hilarious, and they think of you suddenly as a comedian. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you think of yourself as that plus much more. And My fiance calls her the Meryl Streep of comedy. The Meryl Streep of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, I mean, and, and sh you've been, you were terrific in Costumes, that. Costumes, fake glasses, uh, nose, fake noses, <laughs> <laughs> fanny packs. But, you know, I mean, it must have felt, I would imagine it felt nice to have the opportunity to do something different from that. I, know, well, I really didn't come out here until I was, or start in this kind of world that wasn't theater, I guess, world of cameras, until I was like 30. And so, I, and I always felt, it was always a small part in a huge, big, huge court, like you said, like studio machine. So I, I spent most of my 30s feeling like a guest on somebody else's set. Like I would, I always, you know, wasn't my hair and makeup trailer. I didn't know that I, I kind of had to, a lot of the energy was trying to get the vibe and, and be my own dramaturg, kind of know what this particular role was in the scheme of something bigger and just fulfill that and I'm not afraid of a big swing. <laughs> doesn't doesn't scare me. Um, and I think there was something about it was Adam McKay actually. The when I when I did that small part in Anchorman, I just that really like cracked something open for me as an actor, not just as a, in comedy, but just there was something so anarchic about it, about the or something lawless and, and like just so rock and roll about the way he approaches comedy and that everybody was like a decent, good, generous human. And there's something about the comedy world that I still feel like I can't believe I'm invited to that party in any way that is like such an awesome, you should, it's such a great supportive community. Like it's such a great group of humans. And I would never call myself a comedian because I respect comedians too much. Like, I'm, you guys, Diary of the Mouth, I can't stop talking. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But I, there is something in this movie that was, 
I always knew it was in there. Like that's why I started as an, I love, like talked about it before, as an actress. Like I, you know, you always feel like the lead in whatever you're doing, <laughs> no matter the size of it. You have to. But um, yeah, it but was. This uh, was sort of that first yeah. true, and it was not really calling, asking you to call on your comedic. Uh, no, in fact, it was. Uh, yeah, it it was it was it revealed itself to be a little. Um, more, um, ah, just like, just a little darker than we anticipated. Like it revealed itself as we, and that's a testament to Jill, I think too. It really discovered itself as we were making it tone-wise. And Olivia, you've talked about in, in other interviews, you said people often think of, or people thought I could only play the badass. That was the quote. And um, that for a number of your early parts, OC, House, things like that, you were, quote, the icy, confident, emotionally reserved woman, but in fact, it grew to be maybe a little grating, a little frustrating, because that is not really how you see yourself, right? No, not at all. And I think that, I, I, I think that it seemed strong on the surface to be able to be like a kind of tough chick, but that's really just like, like, like scared, really, I think. It takes a, a great piece of material and a great director to unlock you and get you to shed all of that. And, and I had experiences with it along the way. I did, I think the first time I was on a movie set where I was like, okay, I get it now, was Alpha Dog with Nick Cassavetes. And we, it was a bunch of kids that now have all launched these like huge careers, but we didn't know what we were doing. Um, and we had a young Justin Timberlake in our cast <laughs> acting for the first time and everybody was like, what's going on? And he was like, fabulous because, I mean, it was just a really cool experience. And the first time I thought, okay, I wanna do this. And I left the TV show I was on, which was the OC. And I was like, I'm just gonna make indies. And then I had no money, so then I did another <laughs> TV show. But I, I had, people had tried over the years to kind of like break that and, and let me be something else. But I kind of went back into like, no, it's, I'll just be tough. This is good. And then I uh, slowly realized it was just really boring. So um, yeah, I think now it's like, I really shy away from those. I'm like, oh, don't ask me to be that or don't, definitely don't ask me to put on a cat suit of any kind. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, but that's one thing that in, with Joe Swanberg, he, he had actually seen Alpha Dog, and I think that's what had given him the idea that maybe I could do more than what others thought I could do. And he had no interest in me uh, looking good in the movie or seeming like a badass. He was interested in everything, all my flaws. And I was like, great, awesome. Let's play with those. There's lots. <laughs> um, David. Uh, the interesting, one of the interesting challenges that you were going to have to face clearly, I guess, from the minute you saw the script, was that as youthful as you, as you are and look, you're, I think you're 37, you were going to have to play 17 to 68. That is quite a, a range. And was that something that was daunting? Did you say, wait a minute, this might be a too tall a task? Or how did you approach that? No, it was the opposite, actually. I think uh, initially Lee had conceived it as maybe two or even three actors doing it. But um, the great thing I think that theater affords you is that you, you, you can take bigger risks, directors take bigger risks, uh, plays uh, can be less literal. So, you know, when I was doing theater in the UK or even at drama school, at drama school, you get to play Lear even though you're 18, you know, and so, the great thing about theater is once you've been given the gift of having to explore that, no one can ever take it away from you, especially if you do it night after night. And I had played Henry VI at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and he, uh, we first see him in Henry VI Part One at the age of 14, and by the end of Henry VI Part Three, he's in his 60s. So I had, I had done that sweep before. Now, admittedly, it was in the theater, and similarly in, in that, play, we had made the decision and I felt very clear that I didn't want to do it all with makeup because I, I truly believe that age is kind of a state of mind and you can do so much by uh, what's going on within the person than what's going on without. And so I said to Lee, look, I want you to trust me with this. Uh, I think I can do it. And he went, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, to the point whereby we were in New Orleans 
and we were doing camera tests and to see you know, if I could pass for the 17 and, and all of that. And at the end of a day of camera tests, he goes, David, you are lucky. I said, I said what? Because what? I had cast the young version of you. And he is, I've got to go and make a phone call. I was like, I was like, are you serious? He said, I got to protect my movie. I was like, okay. Um, so, uh, so thankfully it, it worked. And, um, and yeah, but we all, you know, kind of faced that challenge within the movie. But I think that that's one of the things that's really satisfying for an audience is to get to see the sweep. I always, it always takes me out for a moment when you go from a young version of someone to another actor playing them, just for a, a moment, you know. And I, I just felt if we, could, if we could do without it, then let's give it a go. So thankfully he trusted me. And can we just note that some of the techniques, which I think are interesting for anybody else who has to do a similar thing in the future, you... You, I think you were saying sleep on the one when you're trying to look younger yeah. and water, but yeah. when you're when you've got to be older, you were what was it salted? Yeah, things? well, we had this crazy thing whereby you know there was so, within a week sometimes I'd, I'd I'd go from the teenager to being in my 40s to then being in my in my 60s. So I, I I and Lee is like anti makeup, you know, just completely wouldn't let me wear any makeup as a teenager. I was like, are you nuts? You know, I mean, I, I know I said I want to do this, but you know, he's like, no, 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 no makeup. Um, and so what I would do is I would get 10 hours of sleep on those nights that I had to be young, drink lots of water, try and have this sort of, and then on, on nights where I had to be a bit older, four hours of sleep. Uh, there was a patch where I wanted to be a bit heavier, so I'd eat, we were in New Orleans, so this was very easy. Uh, a lot of salty food, very salty food, then drink a lot of water. I'd read somewhere that the water then clings to the salt and you puff out. And it, and it, and it literally, I would yo yo, and then I'd go in the gym, four hours straight, drop like five to six, maybe seven pounds to go in and do the like, teenage version. Because we had to do, we had to do this 50 year sweep in the course of three months of shooting. So it's pretty rigorous, but you know, it's it's very satisfying to watch. I want to know product. how you lose five pounds in a gym session. <laughs> <laughs> it 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 can be done. It can layers and run really fast on the treadmill. Like the yeah. wrestler. Yeah. Like like wrestlers. Yeah. Who yeah. Like yeah. 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 You just you just out. just, just foil drop suits. it all and then you know. And uh, yeah. You're like a Victoria's Secret model. <laughs> <laughs> I just read about what they did. Oh, is, that, is that what they do? <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they, I don't think they even drink liquids. <laughs> oh, really? That'll be my next role. I'll, I'll put that into, into action. So, Greta, um, why, was, why was it important for Francis Ha to be a black and white movie, which couldn't have made your job easier in terms of getting it out to the world, but it was important to you guys, right? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, I, I didn't really know how um, limiting black and white was until we were trying to sell it. Um, but it was sort of part of the spirit of the whole thing was when we were writing it, it was really early in the writing process that Noah said he thought it should be in black and white, and I agreed. And then we started doing these camera tests to make sure it would be like the kind of black and white we wanted and working with a colorist. And, and it felt very like, Again, it's like nobody asked us to do this, so we're going to do exactly. We won't. I haven't seen a black and white movie. Now we have Nebraska and um, uh, Much to Do About Nothing, but we didn't know about that, you know. And it was like, this movie belongs in black and white. And I think, um, I think as an actor, it sounds. For me, I felt. Um, I, I, I think Orson Welles said, I, I, black and white is the actor's best friend. It makes you look like everything you're doing is important. But, um, <laughs> but I, I think there's something about the tradition of black and white film, and it's impressionistic more than literal. And it's just the form of your face. And I felt it, it almost like removed this idea of, of what you look like in a shot. And it's just like the lines of your face and the expressions. And I was thinking about, um, uh, Julietta Messina and her like clown face, and it's so big and so, and it. Res I feel like black and white responds to almost a clownishness that you can't get away with in in color film. And I felt felt more like I was a dancer. I mean, I was playing a dancer, but that it was. I felt okay because I think my face moves so much, and I have such a big gummy smile, and I always feel embarrassed by it. But I felt like I was totally free to be kind of that the big features were fine in it. And I think I, it was the first time I felt like it wasn't gonna be held against like screen beauties. It was like another thing.
And I guess you'd also worked with Woody Allen not too long yeah. around that time, and he's right before, right before, yeah. I mean, Manhattan. Yeah. How do you, how do you yeah. beat that? So. I know it was really, it was really difficult. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, it was it was sort of this dream come true. I was like in Rome with Woody Allen, and and then like, I we started the day after I got back from to make t Francis, and um, it was like a good run of life. A minute. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you know you hit those patches, and you're like, oh, yeah. you know, while it's happening, like this is gonna be hard to repeat. I don't know. I think probably with actors, it always has to do with a play or a movie, because it's the way you like feel alive. <laughs> but the key with those moments, I think, is is to know it's great while you're in it, because yeah. so, yeah. so often. It's gone, and you're like, oh my goodness, I, I worked with Woody Allen, and I did that black and white movie, and it was just hard, and I was tired, and I, you know, you didn't engage with how, how great it was. I think that that's a real gift when you can. Adele, with, with Blue's Warmest Color, I mean, a lot of attention obviously has been paid to the fact that there's, uh, it's pretty, um, there's a lot of sex in the movie, and um, was that something that when you looked at the script that, or when you talked with Abdel Latif, that was immediately clear? And was that something that I think for anyone, you'd probably have to give that some thought if that's something you're comfortable with? Was it, was it a difficult decision for you? Not really, because I knew that he wanted to make a love story between two girls, but just a love story, like something like uh, common, you know? And um, and we have to build this patient. And since we took all this coffee, he told me I want to treat the sex scene like the other one, like a food scene, like a school scene. And I want to shoot them like, like the other one. And he is famous in France for uh, he, he hates her makeup. We have no makeup, no no makeup artist, no hair artist, no clothes artist. He was just going on the set. I love your jacket. Give it to him. And people are like, oh, it's my favorite one again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, he told me I want to treat this scene like the like the other one. So are you ready for this? And I doesn't really know what it's gonna be to shoot this scene. So I was like, yeah, I'm ready because I want the role. And I think it's not the most difficult scene to do. The breakup scene was more hard. The, and we we laugh a lot a lot during this sex scene because it was the first scene we were making together. So introduce yourself naked, it helps because there is no like shaking hands and, and you know, you're just like naked and, and vulnerable. And, and so we have to let speak our body and, and, and feel free of our movements and trust each other. And I think it was more easy for me because for me it was supposed to be my first relationship with a girl, a sex relation. And she was supposed to like drive the act. So I was just like, let her do. Yeah, yeah. and it's just amazing because not only was it day one for you that, that you were thrown into that scene, but if, I, if my information's correct, that was over, that was then, I mean, it's, I think in the movie it's six, seven minutes. It took the next 10 days to do, yeah. right? But we doesn't make it like 10 day, day after day, like just some day say, okay, today is the sex scene, and we, we wanted to show how a sexuality can evaluate it. So we make different position, things, and every, everything. But uh, yeah, it, that was special. And people play a lot of attention for the sex scene, and I don't understand why, because this is just sex. It's just the, I think it's how long they are. People are, new, are not used to, to, to like be sit and just, you got the impression during this scene that you are into the bedroom of two girls who love each other. And I can understand that sometimes it's kind of weird because you really sit and love pe two people eat each other and it's also a movie about skin, but uh, it's like this. It's a bit like Bob Marley. I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm sure. Bah, les idées, elles se rejoignent un peu. Ouais. Tu vois, elles sont gay up stand-up. Bah ouais, je vois. Bah, je trouve qu'il est engagé. Ouais, c'est vrai. C'est pareil que Sartre. C'est un peu un philosophe, c'est un prophète, c'est la même chose. En tout cas, j'espère que tu voudras bien m'aider pour mes de philo, parce que t'as l'air... Euh... Bah écoute, quand tu veux. Barca, you step on this... Well, you know you get the part, Captain Phillips. 
and you know that you're gonna that Captain Phillips is gonna be Tom Hanks, two-time Oscar winner, sort of as big as it gets. And I know that you were very excited about that to meet Mr. Hanks, but what did Paul Greengrass tell you as far as how that would go down that first meeting? Um, yeah, it was when we first got there. We did some training. We did a lot of training, and we were all excited to meet Tom. You know, that was the main reason that I went to the audition to begin with. So when we finished the training, it was like, okay, now I want to see Tom. And Paul was like, you guys are not seeing Tom until the first scene you actually see in the. So, Where you raid the ship. Yeah. So he said um, he doesn't want Tom us to be intimidated by Tom or, or anything. So the first time in the movie we see each other, that's the first time y'all see him. So looking back at it now, it was a great idea. Captain, no one get hurt if you don't play no game. Uh, it's, the ship's broken. We had to go. Nobody gets hurt. Easy. Because hey! Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. It was just a lot of nerve wracking for me. <laughs> we just had to um, forget about time and focus on, on the scene because, you know, the, it was just such a big scene, you know, for me. Because that was the first scene that I actually used some lines. So, you know, and it was just, <laughs> yeah. And I have to ask you, because one of the lines, what's, what's so impressive is that that being the first time you're in the really acting, period, but in a scene with Tom Hanks, and not only that, but you then, you know, you, whatever nerves you had, you seemed to overcome because you came up with the most memorable line in the movie, improvised. Yeah. Can you remind us what that was? Yeah, I'm the captain now. <laughs> that was great. <pretty. laughs> that was that first scene, the first thing you shot? Yeah. That was, we sh I shot one scene before that in the skiff. Mm -hmm. But that but was... Not with Tom. Yeah. Not with Tom. Yeah. Wow. Um, Adele, as far as uh, Abdel Latif, I mean, he seems, from everything I've read, to be a perfectionist to the point where we're talking, like, what would be the number of takes that you might do? By day, 100 for one scene, and sometimes we will spend you know, like one week for all the same scene. And, and even if you can talk about, I believe, the scene where you first sort of see Leia's character, that was particularly drawn out? Yeah, and, and you can see in the movie because it, it was a sunny day, and we just crossed the road, and we make this scene like 100 times, but it was like we had a, how do you call like you? You know, you go to the eels and you're making a... <laughs> well, oh, you're yeah. oh, in your heel, you. I see, Thank yeah. You. And um, yeah, and you can see in the movie that like two or three scenes after, I'm red because I take too many sun on, the, on that day. But yeah, he's making many, many, many takes always because he always searching because there is a lot of improvisation because he wants you to abandon yourself and he considering that that it's, it's, um, that he include to make many takes for like losing yourself, not be conscious of nothing. And, uh, and, and he loves to, to, to work in that way. He, he hates artifice, so he, will, he really wants you like you, your skin and your feelings. And you are in a kind of second state because you're really not conscious about the situation, about the movie, about him. You're just in the moment and in your instant, and you just look at your partner and try to leave the scene. But it's hard when you're making the same scene during one week, seven days, or like, what does he expect from me? Well, that's what I was going to ask. Are you getting notes after each take or not really? I'm not sure he knows. I mean, he always succeeds to bring you, I think, where he wants, uh, precisément, uh, precisely, yeah. But, uh, but, but, no, I mean, yeah, he, he can spend like three hours to just feed you about a lot of things, life experiences and, and all this stuff. But he doesn't tell you like, okay, this scene, the goal of this scene, your character, your past, you just have to feed and build your own world interior and, and, and to improvise. Or sometimes he come and, and tell you just one sentence and say, forget it, forget it. 
Even with, with the script, it tells me just read it once, but after you forget it, it wants something to make a kind of unconscious work. And um, Olivia, I guess the scene with you and Jake in, I guess it's your, your new place or his, your new place where yes. he's moved you in, there's yes. a sort of a fight. Yes. And that one I've sort of gathered was a little bit of a tough one. Well, it was interesting because we had um, been shooting uh, for a bit by then, but we had just the idea that this would be a point at which the characters would have some sort of squabble. And there was no real idea of how big it would be, how small. I actually thought that would be the scene where we would finally kiss. So I was thinking, like, this scene is like the kissing scene. And I was kind of in there. I was like, they're fine, because I felt like there was all this tension, and this would be when it finally released. The director had a completely different idea. The other actor had a completely different idea. And so it became just a very, um, it, it became us actually fighting with each other. And just digging at each other in ways that we had already figured each other out. Like, you very quickly figure out each someone's buttons, and then we, it's kind of terrifying how quickly you can figure out someone's insecurities. And we just went for it. And it became, instead of this big kind of like dramatic fight, it became really sort of a nasty fight. And it got to us. And we, uh, he walked out at the end of the scene, and he left for the day. He was done. And then I left a little bit later and kind of shaky and went home and Jake called me and said, are we okay? Because there was no way to tell the difference between life and, and what is, was fake, you know, because it wasn't fake. And it was, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're fine. That was great. You know, oh, it was good. We really hurt each other. That was a great scene. <laughs> you know, and it's, it was interesting uh, to shoot and to know that, oh, that's what it feels like. That's what it's supposed to feel like in a scene, which was a large part of this process. It was like oh, it's supposed to hurt that much, or it's supposed to feel that scary. Um, and, uh, and to also go into it thinking you're going one way and then being surprised. Like, I thought we would kiss at this point, and then at the point when I thought that would happen, it didn't happen, which just frustrated me more as an actor and as the character. Um, but yeah, it was funny. We, we were really very affected by it, which I suppose in the long run is, is the dangerous thing about being an actor. Those boundaries are important so that you don't go crazy. But I guess that's what you grow to be very adept at that. But you, you, you want that fine line, though. You have to teeter that fine line. I think that the realm of the dangerous is where true art yeah. lives, you yeah. know, I, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. There was, another, uh, there was another moment that when we were shooting a scene at a, on a bonfire on the beach, and I just had the sense that this is where they were crossing some sort of boundary. And so I told the director, I'm going to take my clothes off in the middle of the scene. <laughs> and I think I'd go skinny dipping. And he said, do it, see what he does. And I was thinking, oh, well, I'm going to go skinny dipping, and he's going to follow me. And then we'll do a scene in the water. But he made the choice, the very wise choice, to resist, to not, because it would have been totally inappropriate, and to sit and wait as I'm trying so hard, like a siren, to call him into the water. So the scene, had that been written, I think I would have said, what is this? Why is she taking off her clothes and going to the water? I call bullshit on this. Like, I'm not doing this scene. I don't think so. You know, it's like so many things that feel really on the nose when they're written or dramatic, and then in the moment you do them and, and they feel right, especially when you don't know what the other person's gonna do. I was full of shit yesterday, I don't know. Ugh, whatever. Hey, here's the truth. I'm done giving you shit, and I'm sorry. I have no place. You are a grown woman, and if you want to have sex with a disgusting bad brewer with a terrible attitude... I don't love Dave. You smell good. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised you got all Dave off of you. Maybe you're smelling Dave. When, I want to kind of try to establish when, for each of you, you knew that the movie that we're talking about for each of you was working, when it, when it was going to work, when you were first sort of appreciated that. I mean, there are, for some people, maybe clear um, 
to March haters, I guess, with like with with uh, with Catherine. I mean, Jill Soloway won at Sundance the Best Director Drama Prize. I mean, is that say is that where you could you know before that that you'd really that it was clicking? I uh, I would say I I knew then when we were there was a couple of scenes while we were shooting it that just was like. <gasps> where the, that feeling of you, you just walk away like, okay, this is you sh a little bit shaky and excited and everybody all of a sudden is, we did this, um, Jun uh, Juno and I had this series of Juno Temple, mm -hmm. who's the amazing Juno Temple, who plays McKenna in the movie. She's, we had this walk and talk where we just like something, it, there was an exchange that was improvised and something, an exchange happened between the two of us that was like, Oh, it was, it just, the whole, it kind of was the fulcrum of the rest of the movie, like set the bar at a different, that's where, I, that's where it yeah. changed for me. Adele, um, for you guys, and, and again, it may have come earlier, but I think we have to acknowledge that it's a pretty big deal when the Cannes Film Festival, which I think was, I don't know if it was the 60th anniversary, some major milestone anniversary this year, where never before in their history had they awarded the Palme d'Or to anyone but the director, and then a Steven Spielberg-led jury decided not only does Abdel Latif get it, but you and Leia do too. I mean, that must have felt pretty good. Did, did you know at that moment you were part of something very special or even sooner? I remember during the shoot uh, that we were feeling that we were making something special, but not by the success, not by... I was thinking that the, the reaction is going to be because of the sex scene, because of the long movie, because of a lot of things that it's going to be really more divisive, like people who hate the movie and who love. And it was my first Cannes Festival. And, and after the big screening, we, we is even without no price, like so, so moving. And, uh, uh, and after all the journalist critic who were so cool, everyone wanted to meet us for understand the process, the movie, and after the ceremony. And, um, and when Spielberg called our three names, it's like, it's like, I think, I mean, I doesn't realize that we have the, this prize because I, I never dared to have such a prize uh, uh, because I'm only 19 and it was one of my first big role so yeah but sometimes i'm on the subway and i'm like wow <laughs> we had it i mean we had this price but uh i doesn't realize nothing i mean it's strange to come from shadow to light in once in one year everything changed people change with you you on the lights and 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 it's make you more fragile because you feel that people gonna judge you so much hard after your next movie and I think it's too bad because it's important to fail too and to make small movie, big movie, movie will not gonna be seen by no one. And, and so that's strange, but Cannes Festival was like huge for, for the three of us. And David, this movie that nobody wanted to make, no studio wanted to make, took 41 producers to get it made, finally comes out and becomes basically the hit of the summer uh, with I think 150 million at the box office um, and just, I don't know anybody who really cares about film who hasn't seen The Butler. Did you, when did you know this was, this was gonna click with people or that you were pleased with it? Well, I, I think for me, especially on films that actually work, there are two successes. One which is more important to me than the other. The one that I really crave and fight for is, is when you're doing a film and you can feel yourself growing as an actor. When you can feel that you are going to places that you haven't been before. Because, you know, even in, in engaging in this conversation, for each and every one of us, I think the films that we're talking about, the common denominator is uncompromising filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And they create an environment whereby you can go beyond the ability you even know you have. And, um, you know, Lee creates that environment. He is not a respecter of persons at all. I mean, there were so many huge stars in that film, and he was like, you were effing up my movie. You better get it right. You know, Jay he will, he will said oh, he yeah. yelled fake in the middle of one of her scenes. That's what he did, you know, I mean, and I love him for it. Oh yeah, he will take you to the monitor and go, David, look at this, fake! 
Genius! Oh my God, if you do that again in my movie, I will, you know, and he literally will like, t but the thing about it is that he is as hard on himself as he is with his actors. I remember we were doing The Paperboy and there was a scene we were doing, myself, Nicole Kidman, Matthew McConaughey and Zac Efron, and it was just not working. It just wasn't working. And he was like, y'all better figure it out. I do not know what I'm doing in this scene. We're gonna go to lunch, y'all gonna figure it out, come back and do the scene and we're gonna see if we can shoot it. And then we came back and we had, uh, we, uh, uh, during lunch, we were like, oh my goodness, the scene isn't working. The director doesn't, you know, and we came back and we sort of figured it out over lunch. And then we shot what we had figured out. Genius, moving on, you know, um, but, you know, but he, but that, that to me is, is success. When I walk away from a set and I go, okay, I am braver. I can be, I can be more than I have been before. And, and I think the key for all of us is filmmakers. Like you need to put yourself, I would much rather do one scene with Steven Spielberg than a film in which I'm doing, I'm the lead in the whole thing and it's just not a, a very good movie or a very good yeah. script because you, you, you have to grow. So that, that was the thing for me on The Butler where I was like, oh my goodness, I am, I, am, I am in a movie with Vanessa Redgrave and she's on it for three days and I'm on it for three months. Uh. Okay, I, 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 I have arrived. And so then obviously after that, then there was one instant in particular for me that was life changing for me was I went to see the, the, I went to see the film on the weekend it opened with um, my two sons, my two older sons, who were 11 and eight at the time, and my wife. And uh, I did this very silly thing of trying to be incognito. I wore a baseball cap and walked into the Grove uh, Cinema here in LA. And this woman saw me across the foyer. And the minute she saw me, she'd just seen the film, she broke down crying. And she walked straight up to me, hugged me, and started heaving with tears. I mean, we were, we were literally vibrating together in the, in the foyer and uh, her two teenage sons were with her and she said, I just have to thank you so much for this movie. My mother's name was Gloria. My brother fought in Vietnam. Uh, my mother marched with King at the March on Washington uh, and my, my mother passed away recently and this is just a huge gift you've given me. And I could see her two sons there kind of really embarrassed going, mom, this is so embarrassing, you know, but that was such a big moment for me because not only did her sons sort of suddenly a movie now gave them a context to have a conversation, a big conversation uh, with her sons, but my two sons were there watching this and I just felt, wow, they, they suddenly see the zenith of what daddy does for a living. You know, the fact that it can, because I truly believe movies at their best can be, can be formative, moving, life-changing at their, at their best. And this, this has been that for people. And so the, the, those two things are, are a huge thing that have happened uh, in the course of The Butler. And, and Barca, just because your journey, again, has been sort of so recent and so amazing, right. um, I wonder, you know, Tom Hanks says that he told you and your fellow Somali actors on the movie, quote, are you guys prepared to be the most famous Somalis in America for a while, <laughs> close quote. And I, I just wonder what it's been like for you because this is like being thrown into the deep end. And I wanna ask Adele and Catherine uh, for different reasons to answer the same question because I mean, Adele, you're now, you're totally new on the scene and I, I, it's gotta have changed your life too. Um, Catherine, you've been here doing great work for a while and finally somebody gives you a chance to do a leading role in a, you know, a part that is worthy of your talents. And, uh, and I just wonder for each of you, um, and I guess we'll start with Barkad, just, um, you know, how has this changed things for you? Are you seeing an impact already? And, uh, and, and how do you feel right now? Well, it feels good. It feels, <laughs> <laughs> it feels good, honestly. And yeah, people recognize me down the streets now. I get spotted. Not that much, but you know, it's enough. And you know, it's the people, you know, what they tell me is always positive. Like, you know, my character and, you know. So it's, it's really good. And um, as far as people back home, everybody's shocked by it. And I'm just trying to take it slow. And, you know, I have an agent now and I'm trying to pursue this, see where I can go. Mm -hmm. Well, best of luck. And, and Adele, I mean, what's, what has been the, are you seeing already the impact as far as uh, how you're 
going about your career uh, and the types of people that want to work with you and all of that? Are you seeing a change already? Yes, because, um, because of Cannes Festival too. And um, yeah, I, I saw that it opened me a lot of different doors, like maybe to work here because now I've got someone here, an agent, and um, and the kind of credit. I mean, it, it's given me a, some credibility and, and legitimacy to be in it, and to to can like. But for me, the most important thing is to have access to to cast, because after you are on your own and you have to prove to yourself and the other one if you can be this role or not. And I think it's too bad because sometimes there is a lot of people, great people, with a lot of things to give who, who doesn't have this access. So yeah, I'm lucky and it changed a lot for me, but I have everything to, to build because I'm still young. So I think it's important to like doesn't rush and, and take the good choice. And for me, I need to have a meeting with a story or with the character I want to give justice to or with people, with director. And Catherine? I mean, I'm very rarely like recognized, I guess. I, I will, we have a joke in my house where I, like, I sometimes have walking down the street with my son, Leonard, and if someone is like, if I see, if we, if we go to high school, if we see, if, if I've seen, and my son Leonard will go, have you seen the last Mimsy? And then <laughs> inevitably I'm like, no. And I'm like, don't bring it up. I think it's more of like an internal case of the, pardon my French, but I guess like a big case of the f it's happened after this. Like, it's like, okay. It's like such a beautiful short time. And uh, I, instead of trying to be like the good girl on a, on the set of a huge movie and just come in and do my, and make sure at the end of the day, is that okay, is that okay? It's like, uh, no, no, I'm a, a woman, a mother, a human, that's like, I'm excited about, um, really, that really um, gave me a, uh, a bar now of what I'd love to, you know, it's not always gonna happen, but to be able to, to have that be the, the, goal would be amazing to, to try to feel that would be great well um on behalf of the hollywood reporter and all the people who are going to watch this thank you all very much this was fascinating i really appreciate you making the time to thank come you. in thank and do you. it I thank you <laughs>